I'd like to say hello to everybody today. I want to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy International Approval Series. Today we're going to be talking about Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union and how to get compliance uh, certificates and approvals for your products. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about this, but this uh, is a uh, consortium of five countries, and so we'll get more into that in a few minutes. But first, I want to give you some uh, uh, info and tips on the, today's webinar. The, everyone's microphone is there's a recording of this event underway, which will be available after this uh, presentation once they get it edited and online. And then a training certificate will be sent to all who attend today. There is a full screen view next window up in the upper right corner and uh, click on the view drop down menu in full screen. And you can hit escape to go back to the normal view. If you want to send me a question, I'd be glad to answer it at the end uh, if we have time. Uh, use the chat or Q&A uh, comments. I'll be looking first at Q&A uh, and answer those at the end of the presentation. Also, if you're uh, having problems uh, with the audio or anything, you can also send me notes on that during the presentation. I'll check those periodically. And so, um, as I mentioned, today's uh, webinar you all signed up for. We had a whole lot of people online today, and uh, you'll be getting a recording of this. There's also a PDF copy available to use to share with your colleagues. And any of your colleagues that signed up but weren't able to attend today will still get the link to the recording so they can watch it at a later time. Tell you. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm the uh, training business development manager for Washington Labs Academy. You may have seen the notes about uh, uh, Steve Ferguson, who's been doing this for many, many years, uh, uh, doing retirement and is still going to be uh, doing presentations uh, from time to time for us. And uh, he's been training me over the past couple of years, I'm assuming, this role. And uh, welcome your suggestions and comments on that. I've got over 30 years working in appliance engineering, and I've uh, uh, been with uh, working here with Mike Violet and the rest of the team for the last couple of years. Uh, uh, that includes 20 years I spent at Dell plus four years in the Army where I first learned electronics. And uh, it covers a wide array of compliance topics and I have my hands in about everything that relates to engineering compliance. I'm an active member in the uh, IEEE, a senior member, and uh, very active in the EMC and product safety societies. Also uh, write periodically, and uh, I've got uh, like a dozen articles have been published in compliance and other technical papers, and uh, uh, graduate of Texas State University. So this is kind of a map of what we're going to be talking about today. As you can see, this includes a wide swath of land there, but the main bulk of it is Russia, and uh, includes uh, which countries we're going to go into a little bit more. So uh, this is one set of certifications that can get you access to these five countries. And uh, some of the things we're, the terms I'm going to be using today, local representative or local rep, this is, uh, applies to a lot if you've gone to any or South America or uh, uh, places that require a local rep, you understand that this requires a, uh, a registered letter of authorization in most countries. If you don't have a physical presence, like a company office in a specific country, that you've got somebody who's uh, authorized legally to act on your behalf for your country, and all these countries will require local reps. I also want to talk about uh, the countries you're going to be going into, especially if you're a smaller firm. You want to make sure it gets all excited and wants to go worldwide. Well, does that make financial sense? So one of the things you want to look at, and some of the countries you're going to be looking at, is the Purchasing power parity, and this is a term uh, or a, uh, a figure that the ec economists use to kind of rate countries to each other on kind of give it a, a parity basis to look at them uh, so you can see what their output is. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about, more about that when we look at each individual country. And then the population, where I've got that listed, that just means a world population ranking for each country, you know, where the first is most populous, such as China. 
and then it goes down 237. And those uh, 237 countries, if you ever tried to look up all the countries in the world, you know there's no real agreement on it. It's coming from the World Factbook, which is a CIA uh, website, but it's a public domain. It's available to the public, and they allow you to credit to them. I got the most information from their website and, um, and giving credit to them. So uh, there are also a lot of expand to different countries and go there and see structures like as far as communications, mobile, internet, uh, things like that, how many people there, what the industries are, would it make a good market for you? And that's what uh, I did a lot when I was at Dell. We were looking at different markets as it makes sense for us to go in these countries. And so we'll uh, take a look at that. So today, basically, we're going over the uh, EEU, the EEC, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union, the Eurasian Economic Commission. We'll go more details on those in the member countries. And so uh, they've got what they call the Customs Union Technical Regulations Compliance Scheme, which we'll be talking about a lot. And then the telecom wireless agencies, because those aren't quite covered under the uh, EEU umbrella yet, and there's some conclusions and recommendations at the end. Okay, just looking broadly at Eurasian Economic Union. So it has a, a combined uh, GDP PPP, that's a gross domestic product uh, uh, purchasing parity, at 4.53 trillion, which would place them at the sixth largest economy if they were, you know, one uh, group like the EU. For comparison, the EU is ranked at number two as far as that uh, GDP PPP goes with uh, 19, almost 20 uh, trillion dollars. So they're about more than the uh, uh, four times larger market than the, uh, I mean, the EU is a little four times larger market than the EU. And just for other comparison, you can see China number one and US number three. So they're all around 20 trillion in uh, market figures with the EU at around four and a half. So it can make them the eighth largest market country. And, uh, you know, for comparison, the EU has 516 million uh and, and but that's not really a big jump uh, russia by itself is the ninth largest in terms of population um, but we'll look at some other countries they're wanting to add later and uh, it this uh, currently covers about 15 percent of the uh, earth's land mass and so that's about 20 uh, million square kilometers Um, and so this was founded as a uh, intended as a competitor uh, to the EU, by forming an uh, EU type of you know alliance, and so they wanted to compete with them. And I just found out uh, when I was updating my slides this week, uh, uh, I thought this was uh, formed by the uh, uh, Russia was the one that was the instigator for this, but it was actually the president of Kazakhstan who proposed it in a speech she was making to the uh, uh, Russian uh, 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 pop bureau and uh, was. Uh, coming up with the uh, uh, suggestion that they could, uh, you know, form an economic alliance. So it was founded on the 1st of January 2010 with three other member countries, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and uh, Russia. So those are the three founding ones, and then they had Armenia and Kyrgyzstan, a uh, much smaller country, joined in 2015. So uh, the following, uh, almost two years later, uh, they put together a joint commission uh, on this, and uh, that was the Eurasian Economic Commission. And uh, they have a website and has all the news and information on the EU. And it's a governing body, much the same way the European Commission is a governing body for the European Union. They have a real informative website. Uh, you can go out there, it's an English language version. Not everything is translated in English, but I found that uh, Google Translate does a pretty good job with Russian for the most part getting the gist of it. But uh, as always, you can't rely on Google Translate for official or, uh, compliance criteria. So make sure that your uh, standards are looking for compliance approvals. So, uh, Russia was a founding member, looking a little bit closer, and these were those terms I was talking about that I got from the World uh, Factbook website. So uh, they, uh, you know, population is ninth, and GDP PPP is seventh ranked in the world. And so uh, just to give you some 
So if the GDP PPP is higher than the population, that shows they're more productive than uh, uh, the average country. Uh, you would expect the GDP PPP to be around the same as the population for kind of a uh, normally productive, and that's, once again, these are rough measures. But I also look at things like uh, under the communications categories, they have internet users and mobile cellular users you look at, and that can give you an computer uh, uh, infrastructure in the country and how uh, much they're adopting, you know, IoT products and, and anything that's connected to the, um, you know, may not have an internet infrastructure that the cell phone rates a lot higher than you would expect to find for the same size country. And then the GDP composition, you see the service uh, uh, sector is really large in their economy. And you know they've got a whole lot of uh, you know engineering and uh, including software engineering services and uh, really famous for that. So they're trying to build that up. Uh, crude oil production, they've got a lot of reserves, a lot of natural gas, and uh, so they've got a, a you know, economic base for uh, a good, stable uh, economy for the most part. Belarus is the, uh, uh, just looking from terms of economic power, you notice here the GDP PPP is 71st for the population of 93rd, so that shows they're very productive. They're known as a um, uh, very service oriented, uh, but they also have a lot of industry there. Uh, machinery is made there. Uh, you know, uh, large uh, factories are still there. And another indication, too, if agriculture in the country is below 10%, that's kind of an indication that they're really uh, getting the service and industry segments of the economy, and that, that shows uh, potential for a lot of growth in those areas. Kazakhstan is uh, also one of the founding members, and uh, you notice the GDP PPP also is a ranked real high uh, compared to their population, and they've got a pretty good infrastructure with internet and uh, mobile phones, and uh, really in the service industry, over 60% of their uh, economy, and but still quite a bit of industry going on there. Armenia is a smaller country. You know, here once you get past the, uh, you know, population starts getting into the 100s, you're getting down to smaller size countries. GDP is ranked in the same neighborhood we expect it to. Internet users pretty good, mobile uh, sellers, so it's about average implementation there. Um, they still do a lot of agriculture and uh, not so much uh, industry as the other countries we were looking at, but a lot of service industry there. And then the uh, most recent addition was uh, Kyrgyzstan in August of 2015. So uh, population 114, GDP, PVP is 142nd. Kind of indicates that the economy is not real powerful. Uh, they do have a, a you know average infrastructure, internet users. And culture in the industry, but a lot of services based industry and a little bit more uh in the industry than uh, um, we've seen in some other. So they also, this is according to EEU, so uh, they had a list of nine countries that they saw as potential future EEU. I think they've kind of got their hopes high. Uh, they, uh, if they're thinking they're going to attract uh, current EU members, I don't think that's going to ever happen. But anyway, it looks like Uzbekistan would be the most attractive in, uh, in Turkmenistan. Uh, uh, are kind of uh, been going back and forth on it, but it looks like they may be the next candidate countries for joining the, the EU. Georgia and Moldavia have been kind of uh, working both sides. They've been talking to the EU and they've been talking to the EU, and I think they're kind of on the fence about it. But the uh, last five there, Azerbaijan and Ukraine, Azerbaijan is, uh, does not want to join it. They've got some resentment against the former, you know, Soviet Union masters. Ukraine, you know what's going on there. They're very unlikely based on their ongoing conflict, military conflicts with Russia. Then Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are EU members and very unlikely to, uh, I mean, it's just inconceivable that they would jump ship. They soon be enjoying their uh, benefits of being part of that organization. So that was kind of an economic look at it. So uh, mentioned, you know, they found in 2015, but it was implemented in uh, uh, November 2011, and they started working on all these different things to uh, start implementing them. And uh, uh, around 2013, they first started a technical regulation. Uh, 
uh, or they go CUTR, the compliance technical regulations, and so the custom union is interchangeable with the, using the EU. It just means the custom union is those five countries are members of the EU. So if you have uh, approval for uh, one territory or one country in the EU, you, you have access to all five. And there's uh, almost 40 uh, technical regulations that have been uh, implemented now, and there's still others in development, and we'll talk about some of those. So uh, they transitioned in Russia, and I'm going to be talking a lot about Russia because they're kind of the, uh, you know, the uh, big elephant in the room uh, with their economic uh, status being so far above the rest of the member states. Uh, so they have the former GOS certification, which I'm sure you're familiar with for EMC and product safety. And uh, it was withdrawn in uh, 15 November 2013, and any grand here. So there shouldn't be any GOS certificates out there, except for the few cases we're going to talk about. Um, uh, there are exceptions to that. You can still obtain GOS, but I don't know why anybody would, uh, based on it being virtually the same, you know, cost and it being less recognized, and it will only get you into Russia. But there's a lot of labs in Russia that are available, and we're going to be talking about that. But you have to use in-country labs uh, for the. They have to be in-country with the EU. Um, Russia has the most, Belarus and Kazakhstan have a, a, a good amount, and they've been building up over the past several years. Armenia and Kurdistan still a small number, uh, but we expect them to keep uh, enlarging as the industry uh, adopts all this. And uh, as I mentioned, on the existing GOP certificates, they should have all expired in March 2015, and uh, any uh, new national approvals for EMC or product safety should have been done uh, under the new CUTR scheme. So there is a, uh, uh, you can still get got in STB. Uh, uh, they closed all those if the GOS star, and uh, they can available in, uh, until the stated date of expiration. And those are only for products that don't have mandatory certification pro uh, requirements. So if you don't fall under a product listed in the uh, EEU's uh, CUTR scheme, then you can still get it for some products. Uh, this uh, Russia only option, the TR, it only covers uh, importation in Russia, and it uh, uh, only covers Russia. You can't go to any other, other four countries that are members of that. So as I mentioned, I don't see that being worthwhile. So now we're going to dive into the Customs Union Technical Regulations Compliance Scheme. So uh, the product market, if you haven't seen it, has EAC, uniformity. That's what they're calling the Eurasian Economic Union. And uh, so that was introduced in 2013 when they had the first uh, implementation of their uh, criteria and standards. You could actually get certified and start applying this mark for certain categories of products that they had uh, technical regulations uh, produced for. And that mark is basically saying, yeah, you've met all the requirements, and uh, you're going to continue to meet the requirements and, as you uh, manufacture and sell the product. And so, uh, you know, example, you know, if it's IT equipment, you got to have both the, the safety low voltage product safety approvals and the EMC approvals uh, to be, get that EAC mark or whatever else applies. You know, if you have packaging approvals, those got to apply. And it's documented by either a certificate of conformity or decoration of conformity. And uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of those categories in a little bit. So why is it necessary? Well, if you want to uh, sell your products in these markets, you got to have it. Products that are listed. I'm um, using example Russia. They wrote it into their state law. Their, uh, I've got to meet that CUTR is now the law of the land there, and for uh, these types of electronic products coming in there, you've got to meet those requirements. There's also, you know, a wide variety of CRT regulations. A lot of them cover food, uh, sanitation, you know, medical equipment, things like that. So there's different ones for different uh, types of products. If, uh, if you meet all the requirements, you got the marks, you got the Anything that's not approved is going to be stopped to seize at customs. Before you get it back, if ever. 
so uh, certain uh, common product categories, ITE, you know, your computers, your laptops, um, your uh, tablets, audio video equipment, uh, that includes broadcasting equipment, household appliances, you know, washers, dryers, stoves, refrigerators, wireless and wired telecom equipment, and so this means anything you think of, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, this is one that affects a lot of us uh, when we're going into Russia. The main thing we're going to be concerned about those wireless approvals. In scientific instrumentation and measurement equipment, you know, test equipment, medical equipment, there's other categories that you, you're, uh, you know, if you're industrial, mechanical, manufacturer with, uh, you know, got some wireless uh, capabilities built into your machines or your vehicles or whatever they are, they'll be covered also under different standards. So there's two types of uh, conformity assessment procedures, a certificate of conformity and declaration of conformity, similar to uh, uh, systems that uh, have been in place in, in uh, other places, or likely, you know, those that require a, a notified body approval and those that don't, you can do the SC. But uh, there are specific products that are mandatory required to have that certificate of conformity. And if you it's mandated, you got to have it, you don't have the option. you got to get that certificate of conformity. A uh, product falls under something you get a declaration of conformity. You, you can request and uh, you know obtain a, a certificate of a conformity. A lot of companies do this because they want uh, proof of compliance from an outside entity, mainly the regulatory body. Uh, you know, with a declaration of conformity, the proof of compliance is on the manufacturer. The certificate you've got that lab that evaluated and said it was compliant, and so you've got that technical expertise that you sought out, and will make you in a better position if there's a. Uh, failure later on that causes a product recall or something like that. Also, these uh, for the DOC, the applicant must be a local entity registered at the territory of an EU member country. So as I've talked about in some of those terms at the beginning, a local rep. So an authorized local representative, if you don't have a company uh, office in Russia or one of these other four countries, then you can hire a local representative and give them legal authority to represent your uh, company and they can make these applications on, on behalf of the company. So all this conformity assessment work, including testing, inspection, certification, uh, can only be performed in a, a local, meaning in a EEU country, one of these five countries, a certification body or testing laboratory, which is accredited accrediting authority. So, for example, a test lab in Russia would need, need to be accredited by the Russian National uh, Accrediting Authority there. However, you know, they do accept, a, uh, you know, if they're a member of an international organization, for example, those that are members of the IECEECB scheme, they can accept those safety reports um, as proof of compliance, as long as they, uh, you know, are for those categories that they've uh, uh, signed up for with the IECEE for the CB scheme. And there are other uh, IECEE standards and other uh, uh, standards bodies that have uh, similar schemes that may, uh, as long as they're accredited uh, by a national body in that country, they can be utilized also. So once you've passed your uh, Customs Union conformity assessment, you're going to get your certificate. And all these certificates and declaration of conformity, they have to be officially registered by the certification bodies in their official registry for each EEU member country. So if you get your certificate in Russia, it's got to be in the registry in Russia. If you get it in Kazakhstan, it's got to be a registry in Kazakhstan. But all five, they're still accepted in all five countries. That's just so they know where to go to find the original if they need to validate that. So these certificates are good for one to five years, and depend on product and on the, the term. And the manufacturer has accepted terms. Uh, you can request different terms, of, of, but it's up to the agency as to what they actually set for those terms. Series manufacturing certificates have a mandatory annual surveillance. What that means, a series of manufacturers, somebody who like builds a batch of a thousand and uh, imports them to the country. And when they're sold, they get another batch of a thousand imports. So they're not always sending, but they're going to still have a mandatory annual surveillance procedure, uh, meaning a sample test or factory inspection. They may require the manufacturer to send a sample. They may go out to the store and buy a sample. They may go to the factory and inspect it. And we'll talk about factory inspection requirements in a, a little bit later in this presentation. And once they've complied with all that, uh, all the technical regulations, they can have their label marking showing that they are compliant. Some of the more common standards you'll run across the computer uh, uh, arena. 
Uh, so the on the safety of low voltage, you can see our TR004 slash 2011. 2011 is the date it was implemented. Um, and so it was uh, established by these decree numbers, which you can use to also look up when you're trying to reference these. Um, you notice that these were, you know, started for February 15, 2013. As I mentioned, that was the first state they had standards out there that could actually be uh, tested to, uh, for compliance to. Uh, they have requirements for packaging, um, you know, safety and machinery, as I was mentioning. Uh, so it depends what your product is, what specific application is, where it's going to fall under there. And uh, I don't have this expertise in, in, in house. There's lots of agents and companies out there uh, that are willing to assist that have uh, experience there and can help you uh, get there without spending a lot of, uh, you know, or wasting a lot of money trying to figure out the process yourself. Uh, one uh, special category, basically for testing equipment, there's a thing called a pattern approval certificate of the uh, EEU, and so they've got a uh, all these devices out there that fall in the scope of it, and I've got some types of test and measurement equipment listed down here. And so, you know, scales and stuff like that, but it's also uh, the same kind of, uh, use a part of federally requested product manufacturing testing. So maybe your high pots in the factory, um, uh, testing and quality control product compliance assessment with the standards. So. Uh, you can think of, you know, the EMC equipment you're using or uh, any of the uh, uh, safety equipment uh, or any of the, uh, you know, our, our, all like to have this uh, uh, pattern. Required submittal documents shouldn't be anything surprising. It's like most of the uh, well-developed agencies in the world. You can have an application letter. Uh, you've got to have an instruction manual or a user guide in Russian language or in the language of the uh, country that you're applying in. Um, EMC uh, for uh, equipment with uh, potential cloud is EMI, and you've got CB test reports with CB certificates because they are, uh, you know, Russia is a uh, CB scheme member. Ergonomic test report certificate if it applies to a product category, like if you're audio, video uh, displays or something like that which shows the location on the product. You know, this is just a drawing that had to be an actual uh, sample of label. And then the uh, copy of the ISO uh, quality management system certificate. But that certificate uh, is not the, I mean, there's also a factory inspection uh, requirement. And that, that brings up the last item, the authorized factory inspection report. But wherever this factory is being built, it's going to have to be inspected and authorized by the uh, EEU uh, Representative from the uh, compliance union, uh, customs union, uh, that's our requirements. Normally it takes uh, six to eight weeks once all, you know, all the, uh, and that's after your factory inspection. The factory inspections can take long, your initial factory inspection. Once you've got it inspected, it can be tacked on to other products as you develop them. But uh, the initial inspection, you're going to need to apply, uh, allow some more time for. Um, if you do it, you can do it in parallel. I've seen a couple of companies do it, but there's usually some delays in the factory inspection process, and uh, so you want to make sure uh, you allow for that. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the search will be good for one to five years. Uh, also, as if you remember the previous GOSS uh, scheme where you had to include the GOSS certificates, same thing is going to apply here. Uh, you're going to need to include the uh, CUTR certificates with your shipments. And uh, make sure those are going in with the, you know, in. Uh, they don't have that great structure in their customs offices, so you're going to have to send stuff. You're going to be FedEx and stuff, so it's easier just to get, you know, copies of those in, in uh, your uh, shipping documents. Uh, also, it's a good way uh, for your local rep to hand get, help out, or if you've got a customs agent in country in uh, these places, they can help out with those certs also. Yeah, you know, I mentioned the factory inspection report. So it's got to be our authorized factory inspector. They don't care if they're ANSI certified or certified or whatever. For uh, they've got to be a CRT, our uh, factory authorized. Uh, I went through this process with another company. 
of getting authorized and it's just uh, it's just like you know getting certified for uh, you know inspecting plants in the US or North America you got to go through all that you got to prove your knowledge and uh, just providing that uh, you know the requirements they want to inspect it and they have you know, all the same requirements I just included this so you can see it's a same thing that they want with any other uh, inspector for you know the EU or anybody else and knowledgeable and can uh, you know they know how to do inspections they're going to keep the right documentation on things and, uh, and, then they're, and they're authorized to do that work uh, by this agency so uh, as we've uh, talked about like the MC and product safety most of these member countries agreed on uh, common requirements however there's some where they're still happening and the main one being the RF uh, you know, so our wireless telecom approvals are still uh, all independent agencies, these five countries, and you're going to have to go to them for your approvals. And uh, so uh, they, you know, so it's like uh, anything else that applies to, if there isn't a common regulation for the EU, then they're allowed to use their uh, own country's laws. Uh, or, and that's the, for even for developing new stuff because it's turned out to be such a long process. Uh, you know, last year Belarus came out with their own energy uh, requirements because the EU was this, uh, you know, process and it didn't look like there was any end in sight for them coming to terms on common sets of requirements. So, uh, talk about the hygienic sanitary certificate. So, they uh, have implemented this, and this was uh, for things that. Uh, emit radiation, you know, like this, you think of like the SAR requirements for cell phones with you know, specific absorption rate. Uh, that's how it's going to affect most of our, uh, our customers is uh, that they, things that are held in close contact with the body can emit ionizing radiation or uh, things like that. Most of these requirements uh, are actually about food and food processing and clothing and things in, uh, and uh, special uh, requirements for uh, products intended for children or uh, teenagers, things like that. And so, anyway, this went into effect at the beginning of that. And so, device products is in three groups, and uh, some require certificates, some require registration, some are exempt. And so, things like uh, machinery, equipment, appliances, within appliances, it includes audio, video, broadcasting equipment. Anything will be in direct contact with the human skin, so you can think about like you know, I watch or uh, you know, if a a MP3 player or something you might have on your wrist or uh, attached to your chest, and then products emitting ionized radiation, and so you can uh, think about things like you know, uh, in that category, and uh, the second group requiring state registration, anything coming uh, is materials equipment. Uh, so that's mainly about chemicals. So you might have some plastics or stuff that cut fall under that, but it's it's being very specific. And all types are good for children. So children is uh, a special category. So especially if you got a, you know, some kind of um, digital product for a uh, toy, you know, it's got a little computer in it or something or some type of processing chip in there. Uh, you know, it's got special requirements. It's going to have to go through this process and be registered so they can know what the uh, uh, you know exposure levels are and what the possible hazards are. Compared to the uh, hygienic certificate they had sent. So a uh, third part includes products which are not subject to sanitary uh, control. And uh, so it's spare parts for cars, for industrial equipment, uh, except for those that might have uh, radioactive materials in them. And uh, spare parts and accessories, computer equipment, uh, spare parts for electronics, spare parts for household electronics, they don't come in contact with food. Uh, but you, you want to rely on the experienced agent to tell you, uh, make sure your product would be exempt from that. There is, a, for these exempt products, it's highly recommended, and this is also in the previous uh, Russian hygienic pr uh, program. If you are exempt, uh, it's best to get an informal document called an exemption letter from the agency. Uh, and that'll be recognized by the customs agent. Say that this product is exempt from requirements; it doesn't have to have that certificate. Basically, and you'd include it in there with all your other certificates that you would be sending for the EU approvals. This is highly recommended. 
So Telecom Wireless, we mentioned that hadn't been implemented yet. It's been in the works since 2013, uh, and it was supposed to be implemented by now, but now the way things have been going, we think 2020 is a uh, maybe optimistic, but hopefully that will be the day that gets there. Uh, and so eventually I'll be incorporated in there. So now, for now, though, you've got to go to all five countries for their individual agencies. And uh, so for Russia, the uh, telecom agency there is national is Ministry of Telecom and Mass Communications. They've got a good English language website you can access there. And you may have heard this called the Savaz Certificate. That comes from the Ministry of and their acronym in, in uh, Russian is S V Y A Z. Well, actually, it'd be different letters because they have a different alphabet. But anyway, that's their uh, agency website. You can find requirements there. So I'm going to talk about their program and the other countries are similar, just like most wireless agencies. They're going to be looking at the frequencies and uh, comparing them to their uh, what they allow in their national spectrum charts. And each country controls their own spectrum, so uh, that's what they uh, haven't been able to do is meet the requirements on which channels for military, which for emergency services, and and how that's going to be divvied up. In Russia, it's um, incorporated in our article uh, 16, Russian Federation Law and Communication, and uh, as applies to any telecom equipment, each country is going to have their own similar uh, force of law behind it. So you got to submit your application. It's going to go for technical review. And then they're going to testing equip uh, the equipment, make sure it meets requirements as far as power output levels, uh, uh, you know, duty cycles, uh, anything that might apply to a specific technology like uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And then the, they'll grant certificate uh, if it's successful um, and passes for three years, which means at the end of three years, you're still selling that product and have to get an update certificate. There's also a uh, permit uh, required. Uh, I'm not going to uh, attempt to uh, pronounce that, uh, but uh, it's a digital uh, permit for uh, uh, specific uh, frequencies within there. So that might be thing that you know is controlled by the military or uh, shared frequencies with the military or emergency channels, and so those would have to be uh, vetted by a knowledgeable agent for that country to make sure you're not stepping on any of those frequencies. And then you may require a uh, certificate of clients. So for example, for if, uh, if it's a something aboard a ship, it's going to have to get a certificate from Russian Marine Register. And so depending on the specific application, there might be uh, other types of certificates required. So the telecom uh, certification flow is the same whether, you, whether your product is uh, wired or wireless. Uh, so the wired's on the left-hand path, wireless on the right hand, if it's got both, uh, you know, such as a Wi-Fi uh, approvals for the telecom and um, for the RF radio approvals. And so, uh, you know, as, as you've got to get all the required ones. So if you've got a wireless product and it's in a computer, you still got to get your EMC product. I have, I, but then you're going to have to have the uh, specific, and I'm not going to go through the process for the other four, but I am going to give you links to those agencies. So Armenia is the Public Service Regulatory Commission, and that's the link to their English language website. And they had a new logo a couple of years ago, and I've, I've included it there, and that other uh, graphic there, that's their flag. Uh, Belarus has Ministry of Post Telecommunications, good English language website. You can get to there. That's their agency logo and their flag. Kazakhstan's land size, uh, uh, similar to a lot of European uh, size uh, union countries, uh, but they have the Ministry of Information, Investment and Development, oversees the uh, communications and information technologies. And uh, they have a good English language website. Kyrgyzstan uh, was recently, and before every presentation, a few days before, I go out and check these websites, make sure they're valid. And uh, Kyrgyzstan's got a uh, 
uh, issue with a lot of the countries that don't have quite free some of them are more uh, economically developed and their websites down. So if you go out and check that right now, you're going to get some kind of error from your browser that after it tries to connect for a while. But if you'll check in a week or so, it may be bad. Sometimes they have power outages. If you've dealt with some of the smaller countries in uh, Africa or South America, you may run into this. Uh, their internet technology is is not gap. So if a uh, you know a server farm goes down, there's probably no other path into that country, and so uh, you have to wait till they get their equipment back up and running. So conclusions and recommendations, just be flexible, research your markets, make sure it makes sense for your com company to go there. Um, you know, is, is there, are there enough consumers for your type of product? Uh, so uh, getting in there, getting your local rep and getting the business established there. So you can check the EC agency website, learn those new requirements, also those other uh, telecom agencies I gave you. And some have more translated into English than others. But uh, also, you can join industry groups to learn from others' experiences where you can't find things on the official websites. And so, it's like the IEEE societies, for example, EMC Product Safety Engineering Society, I'm a member of. And LinkedIn has been uh, very helpful for me. And I've really made a, a lot of good network connections there. Um, the group I'm on, uh, monitor, mentor is, uh, not mentor, run, it's called IoT International Compliance and Wireless. And another group I really like is Wireless Certification Professionals. But there's a, a ton of them out there. Find ones that have the information you're looking for. And, you know, you can look around. I think you can join up to 50 different groups on LinkedIn with your standard account. So I'm going to open up for questions. It looks like I've got something here. So let me. Uh, uh, if I can open it up here. Okay, the first question I've got was the benefit of getting a DOC over a COC? Well, the uh, uh, if you have the option of getting a DOC, as I mentioned, some things require that certificate of compliance. But if you've got one that falls under, you can get a uh, declaration of conformity instead. Uh, the benefit of, of uh, DLC is that you can, you know, it's it's a lot uh, faster process of doing it, but you're basically declaring for your own uh, reports, and and so it's not quite as uh, a good backing as maybe certificate would be, where the agency is actually issuing that. So a lot of larger companies, you know, for example, when I worked at Dell, we some things more mandatory, but we'd go ahead and get them. You know, like notified body opinion because we wanted that weight of an independent agency that said that we uh, had done everything to show that it was uh, in compliance. And the second part of the question. There, you know, the, the products require a certificate of compliance, products require a declaration of conformity, but those DLC products have the option of requesting a certificate of conformity if they uh, want to go that route and pay for it. And uh, next question, you know if there's any regulation regarding a, uh, a standard right now, and it, I think it's near publication or implementation, um, similar to what the uh, uh, EU has done with their hazardous uh, substances uh, uh, re regulations and uh, what the U.S. has for, you know, electronic products and stuff. So, uh, you want to keep looking at those uh, to see if they come out. And I've got a question: What's the process for? I'm not familiar to say. Uh, but uh, process for it. Uh, especially anything that's got a processor in it um, or uh, kind of wireless capabilities. And I just had somebody answer me that the uh, implementation date, uh, thanks Barb, as Barb work, uh, that uh, is 2020 for the uh, EU uh, uh, hazardous waste requirements and criteria. There'll be a technical regulation just like the other three and product safety. Okay, I think that's
uh, see today. Let me check uh, chat, make sure I didn't get anything there. Oh, oh here we go. I've got a big chain here. Okay, no more questions there, but I uh, appreciate all y'all's time here today. If you do have uh, additional questions, you think of later, this email address. If you have a uh, project that you're working on right now, uh, for the contact uh, Washington Laboratories at their general email address, info, or call them on the phone. You also check out the website, which has links to uh, training materials, and uh, we've been posting a lot of other uh, uh, webinars for free access. If you'd like to check out some more topics uh, that we have there, and we're going to start uh, posting uh, our monthly international compliance uh, webinars there also, so uh, you can get your colleagues to start looking at them. So uh, be sure to contact us there if you need anything. We'd like to make a plug for the IEEE EMC symposiums coming up this year. Uh, in uh, May 14th and 17th in Singapore, if you're able to uh, get there, uh, it's supposed to be a pretty good event. The uh, USA uh, Symposium will be at the end of August, from July 30th to August 3rd in Long Beach, California. I know they've got a lot of good activities, always a lot of good technical presentations, really good training opportunity, um, especially for anybody in the uh, West Coast area that can make it there. I uh, look forward to seeing you there. And... Um, be sure to sign up for uh, next month's. Uh, we only allow sign-ups one month in advance. Uh, we've opened up the uh, registration for the EU and EU legislative directives and uh, compliance uh, uh, yesterday, and I think we've already got over 100 sign-ups, so we're looking forward to seeing you there on February 8th. We're going to have guest speaker uh, Michael Darby from the uh, uh, European Union. He's a uh, with uh, one of our sister companies, uh, American Certification Body, uh, from the European office in uh, London, England, and on that uh, topic next month. If you've got suggestions for more, please email me at the same address, or you can also go to the uh, Washington Labs Academy uh, webpage. The link is down there at the bottom. And uh, we appreciate your time and attention today. Appreciate everybody that attended. And I uh, want to hear any feedback you have and any suggestions you have on what you'd like to hear more about. Thanks for your time and attendance today, and we'll talk to you later.